so Karpov was world chess champion after Fischer and before Kasparov. And um, again, this is presented by myself and Warren. I, I take care of the biography part. Warren takes care of the uh, chess part, and that suits our talents as well. Now, Karpov was born uh, May 23rd, 1951. His um, name is pronounced just like it looks, which is nice. And he actually does have a PhD in economics, so using uh, the doctor title is appropriate. And as you can tell, he's still alive. This photo is actually taken at the closing ceremony at the World uh, Chess Championship in Sochi just a couple weeks back. And you can see uh, Vladimir Putin sitting there with Magnus Carlsen and, and Vichy Anand. And then on Carlsen's right, or as we're looking at it, to the left of Carlsen is um, Anatoly Karpov. And there's two more people in that photo you may recognize. Kursan. Kursan is seated with his back to us, that's right, uh, or directly across from Putin. Is that Sergei Pryakov? Uh, to I the don't, right of Kursan? I don't know, actually. It just, it just looks like a mountain. Yeah, that's one I didn't think of. Actually, the, the person I'm talking about is to the right, or, or to Vichy Annan's left. Huh, is that Korsbaski? Ah, uh, it's Boris Spassky. Oh, okay. Yeah, Spassky's there. So, um, so Karpov is still alive, very healthy, very strong player, as we'll find out a little bit later. Um, but he has pretty much retired, certainly retired from uh, the, the pinnacle of the chess world. He's not competing for chess championships anymore. Although he does, uh, he does come out and kick some butt from time to time. Now, <coughs> unlike almost every other Russian player we've studied, Karpov was not born in Leningrad excuse me, St. Petersburg, nor was he born in Moscow. In fact, he was born in a little town called Zlatust, which is about a thousand miles east of Moscow. In fact, as you can tell from the map, it's actually closer to the capital of Kazakhstan, Astana, than it is to Moscow. So, in a sense, Karpov was not born into the chess establishment. Where he grew up, there were no um, well-developed chess clubs like there were in St. Petersburg and Moscow. So. At first, he did not benefit from the structure that a program like that and the, uh, the trainers like, you know, that are present at those types of clubs. So a lot of Karpov's chess knowledge came from uh, his father, as we'll see, and from playing a bunch. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Karpov's family. His mother and father both worked in a factory, and when Karpov's older sister Larissa was born, their mother, Anatoly's mother, quit her job so that she could take care of Larissa, and then later on, Anatoly. And the father was an engineer in the factory, and we shouldn't think of that like we do today, you know, where a civil engineer or a mechanical engineer makes uh, a really nice salary. That wasn't necessarily the case back in Russia of the uh, early 1960s. Remember, this is under um, Khrushchev and then later Brezhnev and it was still um, a strongly socialist or, or communist economy and that meant that everyone pretty much irrespective of their, of their rank had a pretty modest salary unless you were in the management of the factories which um, Karpov's father later was a manager but when um, Anatoly was young he was just a, a standard worker and so they lived in communal housing they shared uh, essentially an apartment unit with, I think, five other um, individuals or families. And they had two rooms that they shared among themselves. And uh, one was a bedroom, one was a living area. And so it was, it was certainly modest. <clears throat> now, at four years old, um, Karpov, like any boy is apt to do, enjoyed playing and he enjoyed watching his father do whatever it was that his father enjoyed doing and his father enjoyed playing chess. Now this is this is one example of a strong chess player, a club level player, transmitting a love of chess to the son and the son becoming really really good at chess 
Um, a couple of examples that leap to mind are um, Snislav and uh, Carlson, for example. These are both examples of, of, of chess champions who happen to have parents who are about the 1800, you know, category two, category three players. Um, and this was the case with Karpov. So Karpov was forbidden from uh, interrupting or talking to his father while his father was playing, but he could sit on his father's lap, and so that's what Karpov did. He sat on his father's knees, and he watched his dad play, and then when his dad wasn't playing, Karpov liked to take the pieces, and he liked to play like war games with them on his bed, not necessarily on the board, and he liked to imagine, you know, the pawns as a certain type of soldier, and the horses as a certain type of cavalry that you had to, you know, trap, and and so his, he was more interested in war games with those pieces, but when he actually started trying to play chess, he found that if ever, and he played against himself, if ever he had something weird happen, he could back up the series of moves that were made and then change it around and see how um, the game would develop from there. And what Karpov says is that he could recall his early, even his earliest games at age four photographically. And he thought every strong chess player could do this, particularly adults. He thought they could all do this. He didn't know that there was anything peculiar about his ability to do this, but you know, we know that it is quite exceptional. And as his mom discovered, when she took the chess set away because he wouldn't stop playing at night, he could continue playing the games just by thinking about the move. So he could play blindfold chess around age four as well. And this came in very handy because, because young Karpov was prone to illness. And he says, you know, you name it, I, I had it basically, that, um, that he had lots of different illnesses. And in fact, he didn't go to uh, school traditionally, preschool, kindergarten, everything like that. He stayed home. And so he was schooled essentially by his mother, um, partly because he was ill and partly because that's all they could manage, and partly because that was their preference. But he says, there is probably not one single childhood ailment I didn't contract, and some of them stuck with me for months. Most notably, he almost died of whooping cough. So Karpov was often confined to his bed on bed rest for days or weeks at a time, and what he had to occupy himself was chess and he found it very enjoyable because he could play himself and the games would never necessarily develop in the same fashion so there was there was a lot of replayability and what Karpov did was he played a lot um, against himself against his father against the boys in his apartment complex in the courtyard outside as, as many games as he possibly could and uh, he got very very good that way so most of his knowledge was gained by playing. However, he did have some access to books and it did influence him somewhat. The first book that he owned was a collection of the games of Capablanca um, put forth by uh, Vasily Panov, who is a very well-known GM. And he also lists among his early influences Al Yakin, Tal, Fisher, and Spassky. But that said, Karpov wasn't one to read obsessively or compulsively. I mean, he read this book on Capablanca almost as like a bedtime book. You know, he would read through the games and reread through the games and just absorb them that way. But he wasn't really interested so much in memorizing the games as it was as he was understanding how the other person thought. And this is a tendency that actually stuck with him throughout life. Many people criticized um, Karpov's work ethic. You may remember that Botvinnik dismissed him as lazy. And Karpov does not agree. He says that he, you know, he didn't formally study chess very much, but that's because he wanted to have his own style. He appreciated the vision of other players, but he didn't want to emulate it. Incidentally, later on, he had a very similar view of money. Um, he wanted to make enough to live, but he wasn't like a lot of the other chess players which were, who were giving all these simuls so that they can make as much money as possible. For Karpov, chess was a way to, um, to occupy his brain and it was something that he certainly enjoyed, but it wasn't everything for him. 
he had other interests, and um, we'll see that through other anecdotes later on. Um, also at this age, he was a very big stamp collector. That's something that stuck with him. Now, on this slide, I have a picture of a typical factory in Russia. I have that because um, at the age of seven, um, Karpov was able to beat his father. By eight, he's beating him pretty much uh, all the time. And by nine, they're not playing anymore because there's no point for Karpov. And so instead, he enrolls in his first tournament. Now, he's been playing with other people in his area, in his town, in a small town, and he goes to this uh, metal factory where they had a palace of sports, and they had a room crammed full of chess tables, and he plays his first tournament. And from that tournament, he was automatically assigned to be a category three player, which would correspond, I suppose, to about the 1600 to 1800 ELO rating right now. So this is a very strong result for such a young child. Now. By the age of 12, and he, keep in mind, he's still in his, in his small little town in, um, in eastern Russia. By age 12, he's become a candidate master, and he's gained um, some name recognition around the Soviet Union. And he is scouted, if you will, by Mikhail Botvinnik. Now, in the Soviet School of Chess Lecture, I told you that Botvinnik opened a chess school. In fact, he opened the Botvinnik School of Chess in Moscow in 1963. That was the year Petrosian had defeated him to win the World Championship, and when Botvinnik said <coughs> that he wasn't going to challenge for the next World Championship, that he was going to instead transition to doing other things, and what that entailed primarily was opening a chess school, the most famous, perhaps in the world, um, in the 20th century produced many a champion from Karyakin to Kasparov, um, Karpov, etc. So that said, Botvinnik and Karpov weren't necessarily on the best terms in the sense that um, Botvinnik didn't really respect Karpov's talent and Karpov didn't feel like Botvinnik understood his strategy or his style and understood why it was so effective. Um, it's safe to say Karpov has uh, uh, the last laugh in that debate, um, although Botvinnik in some ways became a kind of a friend and an enemy of Karpov that would stick with him all the way through the 80s in his, in his uh, preparation against Kasparov. So he certainly established himself as one of the most promising uh, young players in Russia. By 1963, he's already in Botvinnik's school. He's traveling around the USSR, participating in several tournaments. He starts to earn a stipend for his ability, and this is remarkable for a child to earn a stipend to help essentially support his family. And what he wants to achieve is some measure of financial independence so that his chess playing is not a burden on his family, which he does. Anyway, he was a strong player, and we're gonna get to some of his, his later tournament successes. But before we do that, let's get a look at um, the first game. And this is from 1974. So this is uh, Karpov, certainly, uh, this is about 10 years after where we are in his narrative right now. But it's a good example of how he was respected in the Soviet Union early in his career as a player. And for this, I'll turn it over to Warren Harper. Thanks, Lucas. Yeah, I, I actually haven't heard this quote before, and that was, uh, I mean, I, despite not knowing the quote, that was why I picked this game, because uh, Karpov was really uh, famous for how well he played this opening. Uh, I mean, up uh, up to Karpov, I mean, pretty much every world champion played the Rui Lopez and played it well, and Karpov, amongst all the world champions, he, he probably played the best, I mean... Uh, I didn't comb through a record of his games and gather statistics, but if you just go to like chessgames.com or something and you look at his Rui Lopez games, it's amazing what you'll see. You'll just see a string of 1 0, 1 0, 1 0, half, half, 1 0, 1 0, half, half. I mean, it's, it's amazing his, his record. You can just eyeball it and tell how well he played it. So, I mean, part of that is also due to his style and. Karpov was really great in semi-closed and closed positions, so that it really fit perfectly into his style, pretty much. So, so let's let's see how he dismantled Unziker. So Karpov, unlike Fischer, uh, 
pretty much never played bishop takes c6, the exchange variation. He he liked to play the classical lines. So, so far this is all pretty common and uh, here black chose the uh, Chigorin. Okay, that's what this queen c7 move is called. Uh, you know, the other moves here are like, uh, you can play knight d7, right? That's called the Karis, but uh, Queen c7 was still pretty popular at that time. Okay. And now is when uh, black played, which at the time was a pretty popular defense, although nowadays it's uh, not quite as common. So black played knight c6, and this pretty much invites white's next move, d5. Okay. Uh, nowadays it's considered a little better approach to take this pawn and then play knight c6 to try to give black a little more uh, prospects for counterplay with open c file. That could help him out a little bit. Uh, but at the time, uh, you know, knight c6 still had a pretty good reputation uh, because there were, there were several nice games uh, demonstrated by, I think it was Rubenstein, uh, where black could uh, build some nice defenses. And one of the ideas here in this opening, so Karbov's next move, a4, is, is really strong. So this is a very common theme in the Rey Lopez to target this queen side and break apart those pawns. And a4 is an important part of that strategy. Now, uh, Black's idea here generally is going to be to try to play moves like knight e8, g6, knight g7, f6, knight f7. Just kind of uh, put those knights over there, try to defend on the king side. Is uh, one of the ideas why he has in this position is he'll uh, gain space on the queen side and try to tie down some black pieces over there and then expand on the king side with maybe g4, knight f1, g3, and then attack. So that's uh, a lot of times how the play f flows. So just to give you some idea of why Karpov was playing some of the moves he was. That's the general approach here. Okay. So rook b8 to avoid uh, the win of the pawn on b5. And uh, here, this, this move B4 is, is uh, really strong. I don't, I don't know if it was a novelty at the time. I didn't check, but th this move is just really strong here. You, you might be concerned about uh, a capture and then invading on C3, but um, Black's Queen ends up just being misplaced after, for example, I, I think Rook B1, and then White's going to play Rook E3, and then actually White's going to end up opening the A file by playing Rook A3 and bring this other Rook to A1. So the queen invasion isn't a problem here. But uh, the main purpose of b4 is something else. Uh, does anybody think they can tell me what the reason for that move was? So why would white play b4 in this position? There, there are two main reasons. Equal knight to b3. Uh, it's, it's interesting. That's a, that's a possibility, although that's, uh, that's not really white's idea here. Although that invites c4, doesn't it? Right, right. Yeah, black could play c4 and then put an end to that idea. Get a rook on e5? That could be an idea, to attack b5. So you, you pointed out one of the ideas, which is to fix the black b pawn. So it, it makes sure that b5 remains a target. And there's one other big reason here. And this has to do with a common theme in the Rui Lopez. And across almost every version, uh, variation of the Rui Lopez, black has one piece that's usually bad. You guys know what that piece is? It's the Queen's Knight. This piece is almost always Black's problem child, if you will, in, in the Rui Lopez, okay? Uh, it, it just has a hard time finding good square. And so B4 is trying to control C5, where this Knight could go to. So it makes it hard for Black to find a useful role for this guy. So he, White's just playing it before it rises on B7, but the point is that you want to stop black from, like, say, for example, white plays knight f1. Then black could play c4. And it's too late because now black will be able to activate the knight on c5. And he's, he's found a role for that knight, so he's probably going to be okay. So b4 is important. So black brings the knight around. Uh, really, black's just trying to connect the rooks, although it's kind of depressing that the knight just moved to a square where it has no future. But...
So he, here, actually, black did have a small improvement. Uh, so rook c8 looks natural because it creates a threat to take on b4 and open up the c file. But it doesn't turn out to be such a great idea. Uh, a more, more accurate move in hindsight would have been uh, rook b8, actually. It may look bizarre, but the idea of it is to play queen c8, and then black can trade rooks on the a file. And then the queen on c8 protects the rook on a to go to. So it's kind of a clever regrouping, because white's dominance on the A file becomes a problem for black later. So this will at least let black trade some pieces. Uh, rook c8 doesn't really help accomplish the same thing, and uh, we'll see why. So here, unfortunately, uh, queen d8 uh, is bad for black. You guys want to tell me why it's bad? Yeah, white can win a pawn here, actually. Yep, that's correct. So how does that happen, though? So if you take on c5 right away, it doesn't work, actually, because uh, black will take on a1 and then take, and black's good to go. You have the right idea, though. Exactly, yeah. Rook takes first to lure the rook away from the C file. Okay. And after rook takes, now you can take. And you're undermining the C5 pawn. So no matter how black takes back, you know, knight takes, you just take and win this guy. So unfortunately now black is uh, not going to be able to contest the A file. So white is just going to double up now. And uh, here, this move is just really cool. Uh, this move may look really bizarre, but uh, what, what do you think? Why do you think Karpov played this move? Give himself time to double up the rooks. Exactly. So, Bishop A7 prevents an exchange of rooks temporarily, and just so that he can double them up. So, it's a really beautiful interference move. Uh, Kasparov I later used the same kind of tactic against Karpov in one of their matches. And, Karpov himself borrowed the idea from Spassky, who played it in a similar Ruy Lopez position. And you might remember there's actually a game of Talls, too, where he later borrowed the idea from Karpov. So it's actually a, it's a pretty uh, pretty common idea in Ruy Lopez now. You know, White will play Bishop E3 and Bishop A7 to kind of block that A file up. So, but it's, uh, it's a beautiful move, I think, in this position. I mean, it's one of those moves where you wouldn't think about it in a game, but then once you see it, it just makes complete sense. At least that's how I feel. So. Why would he play bishop to b1 and not just double right away on move 23? Okay, so uh, you mean you mean why didn't he play oh, like here? Mind. What's that? Okay, yeah. So well, you you could ask well, why he didn't play <coughs> bishop f1, right? Because that would let him double up faster. But uh, the, the reason is that on f1 the bishop is kind of stuck. It's attacking c4, which is not a good thing. So uh, basically, he played bishop b1 because he can maintain control of the a file. So it takes more time, but the bishop is better placed. All right, so black is trying to regroup on the king side, but uh, white just has complete dominance over this position now. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to draw a counterplay here for black. White's last night moves look kind of uh, interesting to me, kind of symmetrical. They just move in opposite directions to the side. Uh, this knight h2 move is another common uh, theme in this Ruy Lopez position. So we route the knight to g4. Okay, because on f3 it attacks e5. Goody, right? So the knight's just trying to find greener pastures. So white's getting more space on the king side. Here, it's already kind of hard to make a suggestion for Black. Uh, he probably should have tried to open up the position somehow by taking this pawn, but that's it's also a poor position for Black, too. So, uh, But it is depressing to play f6 because uh, this bishop is just... Uh, this dark squared bishop is just a very bad piece. <laughs> uh, my, my coach showed me this to me a long time ago, and uh, he said... Uh, uh, 
in a picture this in a thick Russian accent. Uh, after I went over this game, I could still hear the bishop screams, you know. So. <laughs> kind of like a horror movie kind of thing. So, so white just uh, rearranges his pieces. This bishop c2 move, it's trying to go around the d1. Right now that e4 is not in need of defense, he's headed for the king side. And he'll exchange himself for his uh, much superior comrade, right? So now these light squares, especially g6, their weakness is going to be really pronounced. So white's just hinting at, at possible tripling on the a file, right? It's not necessary. But now at the knight g4, black can't take on h5 because we have this discovery, Check. right? So the bishop is immune. Just pointing that out. And now black is making a real threat. Check. And the weakness of this G g6 square is going to be lethal. Unfortunately, black is going to have a hard time defending these dark squares now as well. And here, uh, Unzicker just threw in the towel because black has no way of defending this f6 pawn, unfortunately. Knight, knight, has, knight takes f6 is unstoppable, you know, coming with knight g4. So there's nothing black can do. Yeah, and let me get a quote. Un, Unzicker said uh, something after he, he lost this game. I'll try to get the exact words. My coach had a different story. But... Okay, so apparently... After the game, Unzicker in Russia suddenly cursed his position with this idiotic black knight which simply cannot leap out of his cage. And apparently Karpov nearly fell off his chair in surprise. <laughs> Whatever that means. But, <laughs> but my coach told a different story. He, more, uh, not necessarily PG, but he basically said uh, the equivalent in English of uh, F splat 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 my knights, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. <laughs> He wasn't too happy with that. But anyway, so I think this is a great example of just how Karpov achieved his dominance in this opening. He he really just felt this opening like a glove. You know, was, he was really good at it. So any questions about this game? Makes perfect sense? Cool. So Karpov is... You know, the year is now 1966, 1967. Karpov is graduating from high school. He has the, and he's incidentally a good student, as you might imagine, for someone with a photographic memory. He excels particularly in math. And so he is offered essentially his choice of university. He can go to Moscow State University, which is um, perhaps the most prestigious university in the country at the time or he could go to Leningrad State University in St. Petersburg. Either way, he, he can go to either school. And so he chooses Moscow, and he moves to Moscow at the, in 1967. So he's 16 years old, and um, he's studying mathematics at the university level, and he's not entirely happy. He's not entirely happy with Moscow. He's not entirely happy with chess. He's not entirely happy with his program in mathematics. And so <clears throat> he has met um, Semyon Abrahamovic Furman and wants hit to be coached by him. Furman lives in St. Petersburg. And so what Karpov does is he gets a transfer to the university in St. Petersburg. And he also switches programs while he's at it and switches from math to economics. So he's accepted into their economics program. He lives in St. Petersburg. He forms a relationship with GM Furman. Furman incidentally had a very different uh, story. He was a factory worker who had played chess kind of on the side and just kept getting better and better and did well. But, but he was a late bloomer. He became a GM you know, well into his 20s, maybe even his 30s and um, had played in a couple of USSR championships and done fairly well, but he wasn't considered you know, a Soviet threat to win a world championship. But he w did have a strong talent, at least in um, Karpov's eyes for coaching. And Karpov said, you know, there's a quote here, he said that 
he was like my father and, and you know, they loved each other. He also said that um, he astounded me. It was, as, it was as if he were reading my own thoughts. And so Karpov, who's only real coaching to this point has been going to Botvinnik's school on three different school holidays um, for like a, a week or two weeks at a time and very little interaction with Botvinnik personally and the only interaction he's had is basically Botvinnik saying you know there's no future for you in chess he meets a guy who is encouraging and can explain things and is patient and is better than he is and uh, that he can respect and that respects him and um, and he clings to it. In fact, there may not be a single instance of a coach having more of a positive impact on a Soviet player than GM Furman. And in fact, in Karpov's autobiography, which is called Kar Karpov on Karpov, which was published in 1991, um, there is quite a bit of that book, well, about a chapter devoted to his relationship with Furman, and it not only spans his formative years, you know, I'm talking from the late 60s to the mid 70s when uh, Karpov reached the peak of the chess world, but I'm also talking about afterward until Furman's death in the late 70s. They had a very strong and, um, and mutually beneficial relationship. Um, later on, Karpov helped Furman prepare for tournaments, um, and as just as Furman helped Karpov. Now, also, incidentally, living in um, living in Leningrad or St. Petersburg at this time is uh, Viktor Korchnoi. Karpov and Korchnoi meet one another. Korchnoi is the more experienced, the older player by uh, a long a bit, and he has, you know, he's participated in far more USSR championships, and he's um, more established in the Soviet chess scene. Uh, Karpov meets them and they actually get along just fine. They're friends. They play bridge together. They go on vacations together. Kar Korshnoi invites Karpov over for dinner, you know, or for games or dinner or to help with his practice matches in anticipation of upcoming candidates' cycles, etc. So um, at this point, Korshnoi and Karpov have a very good relationship in Leningrad, and, and Karpov in general is quite happy in Leningrad, and it pays off. He has a string of successes which soon follow. In 1969, he's the World Junior Chess Champion. Uh, this was a tournament that was held in Stockholm in Sweden, and um, as Spassky had done some years before, Korchnoi won the World Championship you know, in juniors, and he was instantly awarded the IM title as a result of that tournament success. The following year, he was invited to a field consisting almost entirely of GMs. He was, I think, one of the only non-GMs there, and it was out of deference for the fact that he's world junior chess champion, to Caracas in Venezuela, where he tied for fourth. And for that result, he was automatically accorded the um, international grandmaster title by FIDE. In 1971, in one of the strongest fields in any assembled tournament to that point, in the Alyekin Memorial, um, Karpov won. In 1973, he was second in the USSR Championship, and he tied for first with Korchnoi in the Leningrad Interzonal, which was the candidate cycle of matches. Now, <clears throat> what's interesting about all this is Korchnoi is still quite young at this point. He's in his early 20s. Much like Fisher, the difference is, if you recall, Fisher did not succeed in his first candidate cycle or even his second candidate cycle. It was, his, I believe, his third candidate cycle uh, starting in 1969, where Fisher finally qualified, played the candidates' matches, and succeeded in challenging Spassky for the championship in 72. Korchnoi, or Karpov, was able to do that essentially on his first try, his first candidates tournament. He uh, did extremely well. But let's go back a little bit to the 1972 World Championship. Now, at the time, Karpov is about 21 years old, and he is recognized as a potential future champion. You may recall from the Spassky lecture that they actually had a, proper, a training camp for the World Championship that was run by GM Alatortsev. And Alatortsev sent a recommendation to the USSR Sports Committee that they send Karpov to Reykjavik so that he could 
advise Spassky, but also to learn and to get some experience at a world championship stage because Alatortsev and many other people thought that Karpov was going to earn his way to it soon. That never materialized because the uh, USSR Sports Committee ruled, quote, in view of any outlook in the near future, Karpov should not be sent. In other words, they didn't believe that Karpov was going to be that strong of a player. Part of that is because of Karpov's perceived work ethic. When the Soviet delegations would go to compete in international tournaments, Karpov would play his matches and do well, and then you were just as likely to find him going to a museum and staring at artwork as you were going back to his chess room or his hotel room and going over the game or helping a, a teammate out with an adjourned position or something like that. And this was strange to the sports committee. It was also strange to his fellow competitors because what they did is they ran to the, the shopping malls. There's a story of, of that Karpov relates where he tried to convince per, Petrosian to go to the Louvre with them when they were in Paris. And Petrosian agrees, but then the next day Petrosian backs out because his wife um, said she really wanted to go shopping. and so. Uh, Karpov was left to go to the Louvre by himself. Now, I've said that Sp uh, of course Karpov was also perceived as somewhat lazy. He didn't consider himself that way. He said, I consider myself to be an idler. In other words, he was content to just sit there and think or to do things non-chess related, go for a walk. But Spassky, he said, the, di the dimensions of Spassky's laziness were astounding. So. <laughs> Remember, Spassky is the one who loses the 1972 World Championship and brings shame and dishonor to the Soviet chess machine. And Karpov has said that he admires Spassky's style. And Karpov has a similar attribute to Spassky in that he's perceived as somewhat lazy. So we begin to kind of understand the perception of the USSR Sports Committee about the likelihood of Karpov being their candidate in uh, against Fisher in 1975. That said, he had earned his chance to compete. And he did that by beating Polukayevsky, Boris Spassky himself. And then, in a very, very close match, he defeated Viktor Korchnoi. Now, um, this first match against Korchnoi was pretty interesting, and I will, um, and the reason is, is because, remember when we were talking about the Korchnoi lecture, and we talked about all the, the parapsychologists, you know, and the mirrored glasses, and the mind games, and this, that, and the other? It turns out that started in 1974 in the finals of the candidate cycle. Um, apparently, what happened was that the, the, the person who started it all was actually Korchnoi. Um, Korchnoi had a psychologist there named Rudolf Zyganov who would sit in the audience and stare at Karpov. Sound familiar? <laughs> so Karpov talked to his coach Furman, who talked to Karpov's physician, a guy named Gershanovich, who contacted a psychologist that he knew named Professor Zukar, Zukar, incidentally, was a captain at the Military Medical Academy and a noted psychologist. Karpov says, not a parapsychologist. And Zukar comes uh, to the 1974 match with Korchnoi, you know, several games in. And Korchnoi's psychologist or parapsychologist, Zyganov, quote, was either hiding or had disappeared completely. So the mind games, interestingly enough, did not start in Baggio in the uh, 1977 World Championship. They actually started in 1974 in the candidate cycle um, in Moscow. So interesting little tidbit of information there. So Karpov wins a very, very close match against Korchnoi, earns the right to challenge Fischer for the World Championship, and starts making preparations to contest against Fischer. And, um, he had to get in shape, and since I've shown a cross-country skiing photo for pretty much every Soviet player we've done, we might as well do Karpov as well, because he took up cross-country skiing just like Botvinnik did, and just like many other Korchnoi did, and just like Tal did, and he started working with a trainer. A trainer comes in and says he weighed 57 kilograms, which 
In today's way, or in pounds, would be like 130 pounds roughly. After five squats, he became dizzy. In the swimming pool, he'd swim eight meters, doggy paddle, then sink to the bottom. Karpov was not in good shape. And in fact, he had never been in good shape, probably owing to childhood illness. But in his preparation to play Fisher, Karpov started getting in shape because he looked at Fisher, and Fisher was an impressive physical specimen. Karpov was not, he knew it, and he knew that one of his weaknesses that he needed to overcome was that conditioning, so he set about to do that. Also, there was quite a bit of negotiation going on. At the time, you have uh, three parties negotiating the world championship. You have Karpov and his handlers from the USSR, you have Fischer and nobody else because it was just Fischer, and Fide, represented by Dr. Max Owen. So there were a lot of trips that were taking place to try to get this uh, world championship started. Now, I didn't know this, but actually Fisher and Karpov met several times. The first time they met was in San Antonio in 1972. I didn't know there was a big tournament in San Antonio in 1972 either, but there was. Karpov was there. Fisher was there not as a participant, but because the organizers had begged him to come make an appearance, and so he did for like an hour, hour and a half. And that's when Karpov first met him. And, and Karpov was impressed by Fisher. He, he said, you know, he didn't think that Fisher looked anything like the photos. He thought he was really genial and warm and, um, you know, a nice person. And he met him a couple of other times to try to organize the match, most notably in uh, Japan in 1974. They met and apparently there was a photo taken of the two of them together and it's the only photo in existence. I couldn't find it anywhere, so if anybody uh, knows where that is, or anybody watching at home knows where that is, I'd, I'd love to see it. Apparently there's a photo of them, the two of them together. Um, they tried to organize the match, but remember Fisher is demanding really three conditions. The match proceeds an unlimited number of games until one player has ten wins. A. B. Um, in the, you must win by two games, or two point, two games, loss, draws don't count. And C, in the case of a nine to nine tie, the prize money is split evenly, but the world champion, meaning Fisher, retains the title. Now, you'll recall that FIDE did a lot of special sessions to try to get these demands accommodated. Kors or Karpov and Korshnoi were both kind of against these demands because uh, Karpov knew that if it took one person getting 10 wins, you know, and if, if half of their games or, or you know, almost half their games were someone won, half a game someone drew, it could take two or three months mathematically for a match to finish minimum. It could take five or six months for a match to finish. And Karpov felt that that was too long, and I don't necessarily blame him for that, but because those conditions weren't met, you know, Fisher resigned his title. That match never occurred, and by default, the uh, championship was awarded to Karpov. Now, Karpov, in his book, says on several occasions that he was disappointed that their match didn't occur. Notably, he was disappointed because it deprived him of a chance to get a lot better. Karpov talks about the fact that, you know, later on, he played Kasparov, and had he had had the opportunity to play Fischer in the mid-70s, he may have been a very different chess player and a much better chess player by the time he plays Kasparov. Kasparov might never have taken his title away. That's, this is how Karpov thinks of it. He thinks that he was deprived of a chance to push himself and actually get better because nobody else that he faced prior to Kasparov really gave him uh, a run for his money. Now, that may be discounting somewhat uh, Viktor Korchnoi. In the Korshnari lecture, we know that the two of them played in 1978, that that was a very close map that was originally tied 5-5, and then Karpov won it 6-5. They didn't count the draws. Incidentally, Karpov, for his side of it, said that he did not enjoy that match because A, um, playing in the Philippines was a terrible idea because it was hot and humid and mushrooms grew in his suitcase and um, the threat of a typhoon seemed to be permanently lingering over the, the venue. <laughs> B, there was absolutely nothing to do when they weren't playing chess. And C, because the match dragged on and dragged on and dragged on and there were so many um, manipulations. He, he mostly says it was um, 
Korchnoi is doing, or most notably to Korchnoi's press secretary and later his wife. Um, and he doesn't really talk about anything that was done on his side. He says, you know, Zukar, my, my psychologist, he wasn't, you know, he didn't do anything to, um, to Korchnoi. And in fact, he had to suffer the indignity of getting pushed, you know, quote unquote, accidentally by people in Korchnoi's camps and kind of roughed, and, you know, Korchnoi was the one who wore the mirrored glasses, you know, and, and tried to try to play the mind games that way. Anyway, it was, it was not, it was not pleasant for him. And Korchnoi just, or Karpov said as kind of a way of summary, he said, much of my life has been taken up with fighting Korchnoi, but that's not what my life is about. And part of that is the chess aspect where chess wasn't all of his life, but part of it is also because, you know, Korchnoi was just kind of a, an obstacle, just kind of a necessary evil for Korchno, for Karpov to achieve what he wanted to achieve, which in this case was uh, retaining his world championship. Also, interestingly enough, Karpov said that, uh, and I'm rewinding a bit, but Karpov said that he was actually complicit in Korchnoi's defection. You'll remember that Korchnoi defected in 1975, and he did so by participating in a tournament, or 76, sorry, by participating in a tournament in London. This was the second international tournament that Korchnoi was allowed to participate in, and the reason he was allowed to participate in the first international tournament was that Karpov had spoken up on his behalf. See, in the USSR at the time, to get a travel visa, you basically had to have someone in with connections to vouch for you. Karpov had those connections, and the person denouncing Korchnoi was Petrosian, who had perhaps even more connections. And so the fact that Karpov vouched for Petrosian, at least per Karpov, um, allowed Korchnoi to obtain an exit visa to play abroad. And Korchnoi was going to, according to Karpov, Korchnoi was going to take about three or four foreign trips to get ready to defect. On the first foreign tournament, he smuggled out his papers and his journals and some books. On the second trip, um, he smuggled out some other stuff, and he was going to take three or more, three or four trips to try to get as much smuggled out as possible, and then he was going to defect. But what happened, at least according to Karpov, is Korchnoi opened his big mouth, essentially, and gave it an interview in which he was somewhat critical of the regime, and then a, uh, a handler from the government, maybe from the KGB, showed up at his door and said, what the heck were you thinking, saying things like that. And Korchnoi realized that he might have his foreign travel um, permit revoked again, and that's when he chooses to defect. You know, Karpov doesn't really condemn him for that, um, but you can tell that, that Karpov thinks that, that Korchnoi didn't plan that out very well. Incidentally, Korchnoi had an allegation that uh, Karpov was ready to defect at the World Championship match in 1978 if he lost it to Korchnoi, and Karpov doesn't mention that at all in his writing. Anyway. Okay, so, so 1981, they, they play again. That match isn't even close. Uh, Karpov wins it by quite a bit, and, um, and with that, Korchnoi is still a contender but he will never again reach the world championship because uh, supplanting Korchnoi and everybody else uh, in terms of uh, Karpov's potential competitor is, of course, Gary Kasparov, who we'll get to in a moment. I should also take a little bit of time to talk about Karpov's family. He had uh, two wives. He had a first wife, and that relationship failed um, pretty quickly in 1978. Um, GM Furman died. This is Karpov's coach and kind of a father figure for him. In 1979, uh, Karpov's biological father dies. And Karpov starts seeing that, you know, he feels isolated, he feels alone, and he feels maybe it's the time to start a family. So he, measure, he marries a woman named Irina Kuimova. Their son, uh, also named Anatoly, was born the following year. But Karpov was traveling a lot. He wasn't home, and when he was home, his wife was critical of him because he didn't participate in the housework or anything. He kind of thought, and he admits this in his book, that because he was kind of the breadwinner of the family, that that was fulfilling his role. His wife didn't agree. They grew further apart. She wanted him to be home more often. He wasn't able to, and so in 1983, they divorced. That same year, he meets um, Natasha Bulanov, who's pictured in this second photo. They marry in 1987, and to my knowledge, they're still married to this date. Um, I found pictures of them together 
uh, going back about three years ago. So I'm assuming they're, they're still together. So Karpov did start a family, wife and son. Son, incidentally, Karpov says, yeah, my son, I taught him how to play chess, but uh, like, like the children of a lot of other um, chess players like Taimanov, it really didn't interest him. Um, and you, you could sense a small amount of disappointment there. And I, I think it's, it's interesting how there, we've studied a lot of different uh, grandmasters now, notably Korchnoi, who had children you know, and sons, and they tried to teach them chess, and the sons didn't really follow in the father's footsteps. But to be honest, they're big shoes to fill. So anyway, let's look at our second game here. This is um, Kasparov versus Karpov. This was in the World Championship match in 1986. So the first time they played in the World Championship was 84, then 85, and now 86. This was played in London, and again, uh, for this one, I will turn it over to Warren. Yeah, so I, I picked this game out to show <coughs> Karpov's uh, resilience, basically. You know, he, he was defending pretty much the entire game up, up until the very end. And, uh, resisting Kasparov is... Uh, not an easy task, especially for some 40 moves, so uh, I, th I think it's a very impressive feat. Now, it's not such a great game in terms of uh, a brilliant victory or anything like that, but like I said, I, I picked it to kind of show his resilience. And again, it it's kind of a, a, a semi-closed position, so it, it just a further testament to his prowess in those kind of positions. So let's get started. So uh, here we have Kasparov playing the Kasparov variation against the Queen's Indian. <laughs> if you didn't know why it was named that, now now you could probably take a gander as to why. Okay, and, and here is where uh, uh, Karpov kind of started to uh, commit an inaccuracy in the opening here. So uh, nowadays it's considered more circumspect to play g5 and then knight e4. Uh, in this way, it makes white. Uh, kind of waste a move defending the c3 knight. So he's got to move the queen, right, or move the rook over to defend this, okay? Uh, whereas in the game, by taking on c3 immediately, uh, white doesn't have to necessarily spend a tempo doing that. So not the most precise, but this was uh, still being developed at that time. So uh, knight d2, just controlling this e4 square, which is critical in this variation. Kasparov trying to play a5 and uh, make a queenside castling uncomfortable for black if black chose to do that. So black stops it. But unfortunately, the downside is that uh, this weakens the b6 and d6 squares. So Kasparov takes advantage of this. So now he's trying to open the king side on the other side of the board. Queen b3 kind of eyeing this weak bishop. Uh, immediately c5 is already becoming an idea here. This move may look bizarre, but uh, his idea is kind of deep. It's to release this bishop from having to defend that pawn. Okay. So now he's able to break through and open up the position with c5 here. Uh, the purpose of this move is also to undermine the c5 square. Black's position looks really passive and kind of dangerous, but uh, uh, he Karpov really handles it remarkably well. With each move, it's looking scarier and scarier, but uh, he just holds back and defends everything temporarily. I'd be pretty, pretty petrified if I was facing Kasparov in this position, but just. Moves the king, just defends the pawn. <coughs> they repeat a few moves, you know, typical grandmaster. And it, here, here's where uh, Kasparov started to mess up a little bit. So uh, it, it turns out in retrospect that uh, the obvious c4 would have been a stronger move. Okay? Yeah, I'm being sarcastic, obviously. So the idea is just to target this d5 pawn. Okay, it turns out to actually be uh, difficult to defend it because it, it's critical to keep this rook defending the knight, so you can't really use it to defend the d pawn. And otherwise, white fighting just take, take on c6, and then take that d5 pawn. So it, it's rather difficult for black to meet this threat. And you know, you can play a move like king g6, but 
uh, then white wins. How does white win here? Uh, queen, if queen takes uh, here, there's a queen takes. Yeah, yeah. Is queen h3 leading here? Queen h3. I think black can take this. No, queen h6 and back. I don't see anything there. Yeah, I think black's okay there. The theme is kind of distraction, so the first move is bishop takes, right? If queen takes, then what? Yeah, rook h6, right? And there's there's no way this uh, king can defend defend the queen. I mean, if you play king f, then you take the queen, right? So, takes on h6, and then white wins the queen, right? Yeah. So c4 would have put black in a tough spot. Uh, but in the game he played here, okay. Uh, he attacks d5 in a different way, but uh, it's not quite as effective because this e4 pawn can be taken. Right, whereas if you play C4, it can't. So, I, I find it really interesting how messy this game is. It's just so complicated. It's kind of mind-boggling. It's hard to understand by just looking at it, but I, th I think it's fun how well he defends. Though. By the way, the the computer does not like Karpov's position for pretty much the whole game. I mean, mm -hmm. At this point, uh, you know, looking at it with, uh, I mean, I, Houdini 1.5 isn't the strongest engine, but it's still strong enough, and it gives, you know, white is basically plus two or plus three here. So white's, white's position is very good. But although it's good, uh, there's not no obvious win anywhere, right? It's just uh, white has the advantage of this uh, queen side passers, right? But Karpov does have this mass of pawns, and uh, it turns out his king is actually safer than Kasparov here. And Kasparov still plays accurately, except for this move. This, this was his uh, first blunder of the game, and uh, I think it was more or less exhaustion, because uh, at this point, it was, it was very late in the game. It was 38 moves, and uh, I'm sure Kasparov was very tired at this point. And I think he was... Uh, he, I think he basically was expecting Karpov to roll over, and he never did. So, uh, the the problem with this move is uh, King G6, and it puts White in a tough spot because uh, in this in this in this position, uh, White does not actually want to trade queens because that's where um, if you trade queens in this position, then the weakness of White's king really kind of sticks out. Uh, because here, without the queen on the board for white, he can't launch an attack on black. And his king being stuck on e1 really tells. So, so white has to take because otherwise if you play like rook h4, then black will take, and then play rook d8. And then black is gonna cause some damage to white's king here. It's not easy to suggest anything for white. So he trades, but uh, it's a tough position now. It's hard, it's hard to say what you can do to defend White's king. You play c4 to defend this d2 square, right? Because black was threatening to put both the rooks down there. <coughs> Unfortunately, White's king is kind of boxed in. Can't really run anywhere. sets up a nice trick. Rook d1 may look scary because white's about to promote, but after e3, uh, white's in big trouble. <laughs> so black's immediately threatening. Rook f2, followed by rook takes e1, mate, right? And the only reasonable way of defending that would be like rook f3. But then how does black finish the game? Uh, if e2, then king f2, I think. King g4? King g4. I think uh, white can get away with promoting now. If you take on here, then white will check. Why did 
Exactly. Yeah, the problem now is if white queens, then knight g3, king g1, it's mate. And if rook takes, then we have the same mate as before, right? Very pretty. That's kind of a fun way to end the world championship game. Yeah, so I, I think that that's really, uh, you know, despite the fact that Karpov didn't play anything brilliant, I think it's one of his best games, you know, just defending move after move after move for probably about 40 moves. I mean, that's most people would have snapped long before that. So uh, I, I think it's really impressive that he held on, you know. Most, most positions where you see Kasparov up plus three, he usually wins. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm impressed that Karpov managed to confuse him. Any questions about that game? This, this was played in London, so the match was kind of weird. I, it was actually split between uh, two or three different cities, I think. And the second half of the match was played in London. So before that, I think they had played some games in, in Moscow or, or somewhere else. Last for the split, was it... Yeah, I don't know why they split. This happened quite yeah. a bit in the mid '80s, actually. They, the World Championship Series was split between two cities. Uh -huh. They play half their matches in one, half in the other, and it probably was a method of uh, getting more sponsorship money for the matches themselves, mm -hmm. because these were these were longer match series, and so, um, you know, they they wanted. I, I think they probably just wanted enough. Uh, each city to get a taste, you know, and also because if you have 30 matches in one city, it's not as, as nice, or 24 matches in one city, it's perhaps not as nice as having 12 in two cities. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure about what the chess was like in London before these World Championships, but uh, I, I know that uh, a after that match occurred there, it seems like chess actually really did uh, accelerate in, in Great Britain, and uh, in, today you have the London Classic that's held annually, and that's a Fantastic tournament. You know, we just had it recently too. So, yeah. I, I have no idea if the two if the two are related, but it sure seems like it. Yeah, in, in 1990, in the Canada cycle, you have like three players from England reaching like the la the top 16 or something. Yeah. And before that, you had zero. You know, for the longest <laughs> time. But obviously, Nigel Short obviously being winning the Canada cycle to challenge as far off in '93. Right. So yeah, it looks like it, it probably did have some effect. All right, well, that's all I had for that one. Okay, so to talk about the rivalry between Kasparov and Karpov, we tend to remember the fact that Kasparov got the better of Karpov, won the world championship, retained that world championship. It seems like longer, and historically, we usually rank Kasparov above Karpov, and I'm not saying that that's inaccurate. But I was actually surprised to see the match records between the two of them for all of their different world championship bouts. In 1984, um, very famously, went on 48 matches before the president of FIDE called it. And you have Karpov getting the better of Kasparov. 85, other way around. 86, Kasparov barely wins. 87, it's actually a draw, but Kasparov retains the title. And in 1990, again, Kasparov barely wins. Most of their matches, by far, were um, draws. Now, if you look at their match record overall, Kasparov has a definite edge in their match record. But for this particular period of time, 84 to 1990, Kasparov only had two more wins out of 144 matches. So it was very, very close. And um, to hear... Kasparov tell it, despite the fact that they were certainly large rivals, Kasparov likes to, or, or said, you know, at the time, the only, the only person in the world who understood what was going on on that chessboard was Karpov, you know, other than Kasparov himself, obviously. So they, there, there was a, a, a sort of a solidarity there, even though it would be many years before the, um, the players would really speak to each other outside of a chess context. So let's go through this kind of year by year. 1984, you have, this, this is played in Moscow, and you have a, a FIDE rules that say it's the first player to six wins. And Karpov jumps out to a very early lead. In fact, if you look, after nine games, 
Karpov has four wins, Kasparov has zero. And it looks like Kasparov is going to get eliminated very, very quickly. If it's the first player to six wins and Karpov has um, four wins after nine matches, you're anticipating, well, this might go another five, six matches, but Kasparov's in trouble. But then Kasparov turns it around somewhat, and they have like 17 straight draws. And this is the first, and to my knowledge, the only time this has ever happened in World Championship Chess that you have 17 straight draws, but they did. Game 27, Karpov wins his fifth game, and it looks like he might be 6-0-ing Kasparov again. But in match 32, Kasparov, well, at first he gets several draws in a row to stave off defeat, and then in 32 gets his first win. And then in matches 47 and 48, Kasparov gets his second and third wins. And at this point, FIDE president Florencio Kepamanis, studying the health of both players after such an extended series, calls it and says there is no result. Karpov retains his title. We will have a rematch uh, later this year, which was 1985. Well. If you're Kasparov, and we'll, we'll talk about this in the Kasparov lecture, you could imagine that from his perspective, he thinks he has the momentum on his side. And he thinks, well, I'm the younger player. You know, I have the better endurance. Um, you know, I had my back against the wall, but I really turned it around. I was down 5-0. Now it's 5-3. Give me some time. And, and it's interesting, Karpov and Kempomanis were actually pretty close. And there is some theory that Karpov obviously never acknowledges in his book, but that Campomanus feared that if the match kept going that Karpov was going to get beat, and so he kind of acted in his favor. Now, that's speculation. We don't know if uh, that's true. But I also want to point out that in 1984, and I, I chuckle because in 1984, guess what Garry Kasparov does for the World Championship match? He brings in his own parapsychologist. So. An Armenian parapsychologist by the name of Tofik Dadashev um, was essentially hired by the Kasparov team to come in and um, help Kasparov. And Karpov wonders what the extent of that help is, whether he was trying to, you know, unnerve uh, Karpov or, or whether, you know, or, or if he was just providing counseling. And per Karpov, Dadashev came up to him and said, I didn't do anything bad to you. I only helped Kasparov. You understand that these are two completely different things. Kasparov seemed to me so pure, inexperienced, and naive. He was so confused he needed support. But now I see this is, that this was only a mask because he makes use of a situation not for good, as I had hoped. No, he breeds evil. But it didn't harm you, believe me. <laughs> so this whole thing about mind games, which starts in 1974 with Korchnoi, and continues in 1977 between Korshnoi and Karpov is again rearing its head in, um, in 1984 in the World Championship match between Karpov and Kasparov. Incidentally, a book was written called The Dadashev Phenomenon and published in, I think, 1985, and the foreword of that book was written by Garry Kasparov. Um, Dadashev still, is still alive. He's in Moscow. He's a psychic medium. If you'd like to uh, consult him, I'm sure you can for a low, low cost of, you know, and a psychic medium. Yep. Kid you not. And so the, sh the shenanigans kind of continue. Just FYI. There were allegations of listening devices and all sorts of other things, but the psychic industry. Now, we had a bit of a crisis because the world championship was left unresolved. So what happens is a Brit that you may have heard of named Raymond Keane, who happens to be a grandmaster, offers a solution, says, let's declare this match a draw, and the players share the word world title, and then the tie can be broken at a match held in London that can start in like two months. And the Soviets agreed to everything except for the two months part. They said, no, let's start it like in six months, let's give the players some time. So six months later, in 1985 in uh, Moscow, a a return match was held. This time they were going to limit it to 24 matches total, or the first person to reach 12.5 points or greater. 
and it went down to the absolute wire going into the last round. Karpov needed a win to draw the match and retain his title. He actually lost and lost his title. So Kasparov in 1985 won the world championship. There was a clause in their contract which said if, Kar if Kasparov won, that Karpov had the right to return match. That return match was held in 1986, and this was the series that was held in London and um, the Soviet Union as well. Another 24 match series. Going into the last round, Karpov needs a win to draw the match, which unfortunately would have meant Kasparov retaining his title. He managed a, a draw, and Kasparov retained his title in, again, a very, very close match. But you can see Karpov had a very nice streak in matches 17, 18, and 19, winning three straight in a, a series between them where probably two-thirds or three-quarters of the games are drawn, winning three in a row is, is quite something, particularly uh, when you're alternating colors, obviously. So, um, 86, again, the same result. 1987, uh, this time Karpov had to re-qualify through the candidate cycle. He had to win in match play to win the right to face Kasparov, which he did. Um, they played again, and this match was completely drawn. And, oh my gosh, it was so close from Karpov's perspective, because going into the last round, all Karpov needed was a draw. A draw, and he's champion. And Kasparov, in a very clutch performance, and I haven't actually looked at this game to see if it was a clutch performance by Kasparov or whether Karpov um, played sloppily, but in a... In a a clutch performance nonetheless, Kasparov wins that match to draw, or wins the, the, the 24th game to draw the match to retain his title, but it was that close. It was a, it was a, a great match playing Kasparov, Karpov. Okay. Really well. Okay. Yeah, Kasparov talked a lot about a strategy going into the game about, he played the English opening, so he didn't play mm -hmm. anything aggressive, and just played slowly and grinded it out. Yeah. Okay, and the final time that, um, that they played in a FIDE championship, and the final time that Kasparov played in a FIDE championship, incidentally, was in 1990. And this was played in uh, Lyon, France, and in New York City, in those two cities. And so, um, in 1990, again, a very close match, but again, uh, Karpov fell a little bit short. He won game 23 to make it a little closer. If he would have won the last match, then he could have drawn it. But still, Kasparov retains his title. Okay, now, in 1993, we have an interesting split. We're gonna get into this more in the, in the Kasparov lecture because what happens is, Kasparov is the champion. Through the candidate cycle, um, Nigel Short is his challenger. And Fide says, the World Championship match will take place in Manchester, in England. Now, you may recall from the talk of Fisher that there are three parties to the negotiation. There is the champion, there is the challenger, and there is Fide. And Fide said, we already have the winning bid. This is where you're playing. This is the prize pool. And Kasparov in short said, well, wait a second. Where's our input? What if we don't want to play there? What if we want to play somewhere else? So what Kasparov and Short did is they decided to split off from FIDE. They formed their own organization called PCA, Professional Chess Association, had sponsorship dollars from uh, Intel, and they formed their own league that was a competitive, that was a competitor to FIDE. FIDE left with a vacuum of not only their champion, but also their challenger, takes their number three and four finishers in the candidate cycle, which is Jan Tinman and um, and Karpov, Anatoly Karpov, and has them play a match with the winner becoming the world champ or their FIDE champion, and that is uh, Karpov. So Karpov was FIDE champion from 1975 to 1984, and then again from 1993 until 1999. He defends his title successfully in 96 and in 99, and then uh, resigns his title, sorry, I have this on the next couple slides, and resigns his title in, uh, after the 1998 match, before the 2000 match, because they changed the format 
and you know he w he didn't agree with the format. So he beats Tinman handily, you know, 12 12.5 to 8.5 in just 21 matches. Beats Komsky. There's Gadakomsky who's is he the current US champion? Gadakomsky? Yes. Okay, so Gadakomsky who is uh, a player who's still at the the top levels of competitive chess in the United States today. Beats him in uh, 1996. And then uh, in 1998, in a modified format, he beats Avishy Anand. Now, I say modified format because essentially what happened is, is there was a bunch of, like, there were like 100 players playing knockout matches, and then it led to Karpov playing Anand, and so they didn't have a long match like normal. They played the best of six games, and it was drawn after that. So they played two rapid games, and Karpov won those rapid games to retain his title there. So that one was, uh, you see Fides really tweaked the world championship format in this time period. And a lot of people are even wondering if Karpov is a legitimate champion because Kasparov is not participating in Fide events. Now, Kasparov isn't participating in Fide events, never did ever again. Um, Short isn't participating in Fide events, to my knowledge, never did ever again. But most of the other players are still participating in both. So the PCA had Kasparov, who retained his championship until 2000 when Kramnik beat him. But Anand and Kramnik and Topolov and a lot of other the big names, they were playing in both cycles, essentially. And, you know, there was money for both, so why not? Now, um, by far... And, and so you, you might wonder, who was, who was really world champion at this time? Well... And Kasparov hasn't played Karpov since 1990, but they're both signed up to participate in a tournament in Linares, Spain in 1994, and it is going to have the strongest players in the field. In fact, the average ELO for the tournament was something like, uh, it was 2685, which was at that point the highest average rating for participants that had ever existed in a chess tournament. And Kasparov, and I'm paraphrasing here, but he said, you know, the winner could consider him, himself the champion of tournament chess. He probably regretted saying that because Karpov had the best tournament of his career and one of the best performances that's ever occurred in chess. In fact, it was considered the best performance in chess, except maybe for Al Yakin's performance at um, Blood or San Remo, or Caruana's recent performance at the Sinkerfeld Cup could did have a higher performance rating, did have as strong of a field, and did have just as impressive of, of a performance by the winner. Um, but Karpov didn't just win; he dominated. If you win this against this field by 2.5 points for clear first, that was huge. And you see the performance rating, at least uh, according to you know, people who are better at math than I am was was figured to be 29.85, which up until that point was the highest performance rating ever um, ever registered. I think Caruana's performance rating at, at the Singleville Cup was like 3,100, was it not? Yeah, it was, it, it was pretty ridiculous. <laughs> but Karpov had the strongest performance of his career, and this goes to show that even in 1994 when FIDE and PCA were split, that Karpov was still a contender and still, I don't know if he would have beaten Kasparov in match play or not. Um, all we can do is speculate. But the point was it still would have been really, really competitive and it's a shame that it didn't happen. But we'll get into the reasons for that uh, next month with Kasparov. Before we do that, let's get into our final game, which is from this particular tournament, and considered Karpov's immortal. Yeah, this game is kind of fun. It's, it's almost kind of uh, out of character for him. Uh, it features uh, three rook sacrifices, actually. Uh, I can't think of many games like that, so it's kind of unique. So like Lucas said, this is a game from that tournament. So Topolov might be a name you recognize. He played uh, Kramnik for the World Championship, and I don't know what year it was. Uh, 2007, 2006, something like that. Uh, so he's and he's still a very strong player today. I think he's in the top ten. Uh, 
So at, at the time, Topolov would have been uh, pretty young, younger than Karpov anyway. So let's get started. So Topolov has always been kind of an aggressive player, and here he's trying to play the Benoni, but uh, Karpov wants none of that. So he doesn't push D5. So this is the kind of position that Karpov does well in. Again, we have this kind of uh, semi-close type situation, and uh, he just has really uh, a nice space advantage here. And here he's immediately trying to target D6, and uh, Topolov tries to combat this. So he wants White to move the bishop, but uh, Karpov, by the way, was definitely a fan of the two bishops, much like myself, right? So here he made a move that was kind of surprising. For him, anyway, he played e3. So kind of interesting that he would give up a bishop, you know, on purpose here, uh, for the sake of uh, having this really nice kingside pawn structure. I say nice because he covers this e5 square, and the the prospect of a, a kingside majority of using that is uh, is pretty useful here for White. So black, it's really hard to suggest what to do for black here because despite having the two bishops, uh, they don't really have an obvious target. Uh, this bishop on c8, it's hard to activate it because black does not want to play e5 because then d5 would become weak. So you can't really activate it along that diagonal. And it's tough to fianchetto it because white's bishop is exerting its influence there. So this is a tricky position for black to play. And here, uh, where Topolov probably made his first mistake, he played g6, and this uh, really critically weakens his king side. Uh, he, he should have tried to avoid this, perhaps playing uh, maybe a move like rook d8, okay, bolstering d6, and defending that bishop, which we'll see later on is uh, pretty important. Because uh, after, after g6, Karpov plays a really nice move, h4. And it may not look entirely obvious, but when you have this kingside majority like Karpov has, you want to make use of it. And here, exchanging the h-pawns really weakens black's king position. So it's, it's really useful to, to trade these kingside pawns off. And here, Karpov takes advantage of the loose bishop on b7. So what do you, what do you guys think he played? Yeah, exactly. Uh, it kind of puts black in a tough spot, right? So uh, if he takes on c5, he loses that bishop. Turns out what he does, but uh, it's hard to suggest much else because you can't move a rook to defend it because then your knight on c6 falls. Uh, you, you could use your queen to defend it, but then you lose his pawn on b5, right? And uh, if bishop b8, then white can sacrifice on e6. And you get a nice initiative this way. Okay, already threatening moves like bishop takes c6, right? Uh, so it's it's already a difficult position for black after knight c5 here. What's that? Oh, okay. So now black is fighting the sign on c6, and the bishop on e7 is hanging. It looks critical for black, but uh, fortunately he has this kind of clever move here. So it, it looks like if, if white just plays bishop takes, then black can play rook a7. And it's all good because now he's going to win that bishop back. Because the queen can't move anywhere to defend that guy. So it looks like he's okay. But uh, here, here's where Karpov starts to have fun. <laughs> that kind of gives it away, right? You're probably going to look at moves like that. So... Yeah, this, uh, this is a problem for black. So since the white queen didn't have any squares to go to before, Karpov makes room. So the concept is now after f takes, white will take, and now he can take this guy. Mm. And not only did white obtain two pawns for the exchange, but he will continue to attack, right? He can play like bishop b4, knight d5, black's going to be under a lot of pressure. 
so in the game, Topal uh, tried to not bite on the first time and just play in between move, attacking it. So we saw one Rook sacrifice. Now, uh, so we're counting. So what do you think Karpov did now? Yeah, here's the second. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so Topalov declined, and Karpov says, "No, I really, I, I insist." <laughs> so th this time he made an offer that Karpov couldn't, or Topalov couldn't refuse. <laughs> Comes a check. Right, right. It's uh, no in between moves there. Yeah, so there's nothing he can do. I mean, moving the king makes no sense, right? I mean, king f8, then now you're just you're just down. Two pawns for no reason, right? So he attacked with the rook this time, but like we said, white for the white for the exchange gets uh, two pawns, and the attack continues on black here. So rook d8, white wins this guy. And the pieces start to migrate towards the black king, defending the bishop. And again, so uh, this is a tough spot. Black can't take this pawn because of what? No queen e7. So. Oh. Yeah, queen e7 is one way to win, right? Uh, for example, uh, king g8, then what? I was thinking queen f6, king h6. What's that? I was thinking king h6. King H oh oh instead of King G eight. Yeah. Okay. Okay, if King H six, how do you think White's gonna play? Queen G five. Um, you know, well Queen G five can result in the same thing, but uh, you know, White's White's gonna go back. You said King G eight? Well, 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 first, let's uh, think about why black wouldn't move the king uh, to the h file. Oh, king g2? Yes, mean? yes, yes, king g2. And then king, uh, rook h1 made it unstoppable. Yeah, rook h1 is uh, rather hard to stop, right? So black can't really move the king to the h file, okay? But what if uh, king g8? Knight f6. Knight g5. Yeah, I, I think there's actually more than one way to win from this point. But yeah, knight g5 is, is knight perhaps five. the simplest, right? Again, if, if bishop g7 try to stop the mate there, then white plays check. And then, again, we have king g2 oh. being decisive, right? Yeah, this, this rook is just really deadly. So, so unfortunately, that a6 pawn is going to survive for a little bit. So queen b6, rook d1, trying to eliminate this defender. And here we have rook sacrifice number three. You know, pretty rare to see that since you only have two rooks, right? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, the black, the black king is just uh, there's just nobody to defend this guy. And here, white wins the back one exchange, and then he has five pawns to boot, so it turns out to be too much. And here, black gave up. Right, five pawns and bishop is a pretty easy win in this end game. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like king stuck on the eighth rank with a queen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's not, it's not a fun position, right? So this this was like a, a fun game because this is completely out of Karpov's character, right? You don't normally think of Karpov and, and rook sacrifices, much less any sacrifice, right? So I think it's kind of a fun game. Uh, maybe it's just a testament to how confident he was feeling in that tournament at the time. So, because this was not the first game he played in the tournament, I think this was game number, you know, nine or something like that. So, yeah, any questions about this game? I think it's pretty fun. This, this is really the only, probably the only game I've seen with three rook sacrifices. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, I insist you take my rook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds you of a tall game. You know, if you if you just looked at the moves and you know you were asked, you know, who do you think played this game, I. Karpov would not be my first guess, right? <laughs> Probably would have guessed Tall first, and then maybe some other players. You know. All right. So let's talk about, you know, in 2000, um, FIDE changes their world championship format and 
Karpov says, and, and, and essentially Karpov would have had to have gone through the same process as all the candidates. Karpov found that somewhat insulting that he as a champion would get seated essentially into the first or second round of a, of a tournament with probably nine rounds um, and that he would have to fight his way back up to the championship. And so Karpov just said, you know, I resign and uh, or I surrender my title. And uh, Fide continued on with the tournament that was won by Alexander Kalifman, uh, who became Fide champion in 2000. Kramnik was uh, the uh, PCA champion in 2000, and Chess ended up reunifying in 2000. Uh, Fide and PCA ended up reunifying in 2006, um, and since then it has been just Fide, obviously. Although um, now one wonders if. If there might be enough sentiment, enough uh, anger, I suppose, with with Fide and and the recent handling of the World Championship in Sochi, if um, there might be the the will to uh, consider a different format again, but that's speculative. So, what happened after the um, what happened after Karpov essentially retired? Well, he still plays professional chess. He got involved in politics. Uh, both in Russia and in FIDE. Um, he's known for his criticism of Ilya Mazov, the current president of FIDE, and um, he uh, had some pretty disparaging words for him that I've got up there for you. <laughs> um, he said that in 2005, incidentally, before he ran for FIDE president, the FIDE presidency in uh, 2010. He also, in 2005, joined the um, what's called the Public Chamber of Russia. This was an initiative by Vladimir Putin to create a uh, a body that would look over draft version of legislation uh, proposed in the parliaments to see, you know, to essentially offer opinions and commentaries on it. That was non-binding, so it's kind of an advisory board and. Since 2005, Karpov has participated on that body, on that board. So he's, you know, I don't want to say he's close with Putin, but he's on good terms with Putin, unlike uh, Kasparov, obviously. He was also quite active in UNICEF. His, uh, anybody know what his pet cause in UNICEF was? The UN, uh, essentially, organization for infants and children. Childhood disease. Uh, it does have to do with childhood disease, but does, do you know what disease it was? It's it's one of the most boring things you can think of, but uh, Karpov is a big proponent of iodized salt. Yeah, iodine deficiency in children around the world. So he is a big proponent of iodized salt in, in a method, you know, manner to treat that. And so he became a UNICEF essentially ambassador to promote that. Um, what else has happened of note in Karpov's life? Well, in uh, 2006, he had the opportunity to meet some of America's top chess talent, which included a young Warren Harper. Wow. Yeah. So that was in <laughs> Moscow. I don't know, Warren, if you want to tell us the story, but. Oh, yeah, we, uh, we met in a, uh, so they set up an event for us. Um, I was there for, uh, there, there was a youth, you know, chess match in the U.S. and Russia. And, we had played four games over the course of five days. So on the middle day, we did a rest day. They took us on tours of chess clubs in, in Moscow, and then we later traveled to uh, St. Petersburg as well. But uh, anyway, in Moscow, we, we all played a sign war against uh, Susan Polgar, and then we, we met Karpov afterward. It was an exciting session. Although, uh, for whatever reason at the time, I was, I, done some reading on Karpov and wasn't really a fan, so I, I didn't get any autographs from him. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, in addition to his political maneuvering, incidentally in 2010 when he ran for uh, pres the presidency of FIDE, he was defeated 95 votes to 55. It's a very similar margin to what Kasparov recently lost by in his bid in August against the Yilmazov. He too fell short of the votes required. And um, incidentally, Karpo, or Kasparov and Magnus Carlsen were both strong supporters of Karpov in his bid for that position. 
Karpov then reciprocated and, and supported Kasparov in his bid, despite the you know some of the biggest chess talents in the world uh, combining forces. By their powers combined, they were still not able to defeat Ilyuzimov. So um, take that for what you will. And he still stays active in uh, in chess. In 2013, I was I was looking at some of his tournament results from 2013, and he was at a tournament in um, in France, and uh, no, and Ivanchuk was there, for example, and Karpov was crushing people there. Um, he won, you know, quite handily. And uh, he, he also still has an active FIDE rating, which uh, is, is pretty darn high. Um, he doesn't play a lot of tournaments anymore, obviously he doesn't play in the candidate cycle anymore. And he's busy with other stuff, you know, his, his political responsibilities. Um, of course, uh, he's still probably quite the idler, so he probably still enjoys that. And um, he also is involved in quite a bit of business stuff, which is not surprising if you're well connected in the Russian political machine. You're, you're you tend to be involved in some business stuff. Um, he's also opened some chess schools around the uh, world. He has one in Kansas, of all places, um, you know, the Karpov School of Chess in Kansas. He has probably 50 in, in various countries. I don't think he's really involved in their in their day to day activities. I think it's just something that he lent his name to, and I, I mean, I looked at the Kansas School's webpage, couldn't really find much of note. I think they do a summer camp, and uh, and that looks like a, about it. So it's not like you know the Botvinnik School or something in Moscow. It's not anything like that. At least the the U.S. iteration, perhaps in other countries, it is. But he's still certainly very active. We saw him at the closing ceremony in Sochi. Um, we see him at a lot of. Uh, big tournaments, he'll, he'll make appearances there. So you may have the chance to cross paths with him someday. And obviously you can ask him any questions that you might have, but if, if that doesn't work out in the interim, we're certainly open to any questions you might have about uh, Karpov's life, his chess playing style, um, his biography. I will say that the books that I used um, are listed Primarily, the one I used the most was Karpov on Karpov, which was his autobiography. It was published in 1991, so unfortunately it doesn't talk about Linares. It doesn't talk about this, the split between PCA and FIDE, and I'd really love to see an updated version of that biography appear with the second half of his career as well, which includes his, his work, work in the political arena. Um, the uh, the Karolyi books are great for looking over uh, some of Karpov's most notable games. And then uh, I found a great uh, historical perspective on the um, the world, the, the top one, the World Championships, which talked quite a bit about the psychologists and parapsychologists on both sides, uh, and that was entertaining. Um, any questions then about Karpov and his contributions to the chess world? about the Cold War. Well, part of this we talked about in the Fisher Lecture, where, which was, um, and also in the Korchnoi Lecture, because part of the Soviet belief was that proof of the superiority of communism compared to other political systems was the fact that Rus the Russians exceeded exceeded in chess and in gymnastics and in hockey and in you know many other different aspects and so chess became a way of proving Russian superiority and Karpov talks about this a bit he says you know we received stipends and those stipends allowed us to devote our time to chess and this is a luxury that many other people didn't have you know, outside of the Soviet Union. Um, so there was certainly some effort by the Soviet organization to sponsor it, but it came at a cost. I mean, Petrosian was a KGB agent um, and several other players were kind of loosely or closely associated with the KGB, as certainly Karpov was. Um, that came with a set of advantages in that, you know, he had access to a bunch of grandmasters and a bunch of their knowledge and the the sports committee basically told these other people, help Karpov, you know, beat anybody who's non-Soviet. 
but it had its disadvantage too because he had certain expectations. Even after he got married, he wasn't allowed to really travel with his wife because of you know the defections of Spassky and Korchnoi, and you know it's kind of an insurance policy to keep him from leaving. So the Cold War was not just waged through spheres of influence and not just waged through detente with you know Russia trying to exercise control over Cuba and the United States trying to exercise control over. Uh, Turkey and Russia and the United States essentially fighting a proxy war in Korea and in Vietnam. It wasn't just that cold military struggle, it was also, and perhaps most importantly, a cultural struggle, and chess was a very big part of that. And until, um, until Fisher came along, there was the, the chess championship had resided in Soviet hands since the 40s, and after Fisher left, it stayed in Soviet hands until, well, I guess, uh, the early 2000s, I suppose. Anand? Who was the first non-Soviet? Kalifman was Soviet. Kramnik Soviet. Topalov Soviet. I, I, I think Anand would be right. Yeah, Anand in like 2005, 2006 or something, the first time he won the world championship. So. Um, this was a this was a feather in the Soviet Union's cap, in other words, uh, in, in the uh, in the fight to influence culture internationally.